In the first of these films on the ball game, I spoke of the exercise as an encounter with the self. In this film, I'm going to look at how, through that encounter, a performer can move towards a more effective, efficient and easeful use of herself. Every training process has a set of objectives, a sort of performer that it aspires to develop. In the work I do, I'm not trying to develop any particular aesthetic. In other words, I do not try to train performers to fit into a specific style of performance. Rather, this work is designed to empower certain fundamental shifts in the performer's use of herself. Among the objectives that the training works towards are conservation of energy through efficiency of effort, so a performer learns to do everything that an action requires of her and to waste no effort on things that the action does not require of her. Liveness. The training is focused on equipping performers to work in live performance, though it has been used by people who have subsequently gone on to work in film and television. I'm interested in the quality of presence and reactivity that is necessary to make a performance truly live. I'll talk a little bit more about this in the film on improvisation. And pleasure. I base the entire training on the requirement for the trainee to identify active pleasure in her work. It's not about doing what you like, but about finding what you like in what the task requires of you. This is a way of asking the trainee to take responsibility for her own work. She's working because it gives her pleasure, not because she's being told to. It's also the mechanism that keeps the trainee wanting to keep returning to training. She trains because she enjoys training. Simple. A performer encounters herself through her engagement with the ball game. She looks at how she responds to the simple act of catching and throwing. She observes how her mind interjects unnecessary thoughts, fears, judgments into this most simple of processes. Impulse, response, impulse, response. In seeing how the bag flies from her hands, she sees the reality of her body, the asymmetry between her left and her right sides. She sees how she responds to multiple impulses emerging simultaneously. Is her thinking clear and sequential? Or does she succumb immediately to panic? She observes her tendency towards judgment of herself and of others. She can start to identify what, precisely, yields pleasure to her which is a crucial ingredient in her development of her understanding of the unique qualities she has as a performer and an ensemble member. She might observe her habit of trying to help others in the circle, thus preventing them from having their own experience of the ball game and distracting herself from paying attention to herself. She can observe her tendency to distract herself when the ball game is less busy does she succeed in being attentively calm when attentive calm is all that is required of her? In other words, can she be present even when not central to the action of the exercise? I often describe the ball game as a mirror that a performer observes herself in. Who does she see? And how does that person she sees differ from the person she thought she would see? How does that person differ from the person who did the ball game yesterday or last year? As the ball game is absolutely a live exercise, balls are flying around and require the performer to pay concrete and practical attention to them. So the performer needs to pay concrete and precise attention to herself as she is on this particular occasion. Every day we are just a little bit different. So every day we need to pay precise attention to the reality of how we do this exercise if we are to understand the raw material that we have on this occasion to sculpt a performance from. In the first video in this series I mentioned that I require performers to engage in the exercise without opinion. This might seem to be a perverse request when the point of the exercise, any training exercise, is the improvement of the trainee's abilities. 
There are two specific reasons why I seek to have participants work without opinion. One is to do with the quality of liveness, and I'll discuss this further in the fourth video of this series, which looks at the foundational principles of the training. However, the other reason is to do with how we learn. In the ball game, I'm asking performers to encounter themselves before they seek to develop themselves. There is no point in trying to grow and develop if we do not know what the raw material is that we have to work with. Any opinion that the performer imposes on her work, that she should have done this, that she should have caught this, that she should not have become tense, that someone else should have done their job differently, that opinion will obscure from the performer the reality of her actions. We cannot grow from what we feel we ought to be. We can only grow from what we are. In fact, I go further and suggest that we can only grow healthily from absolute acceptance of who we are. This is not the same as complacency or self-satisfaction. Rather, it asks performers to have a clear-eyed and unsentimental understanding of their reality. From that reality they can grow. The ball game will give performers that perspective if they look at it for what it is. Look at their actual use of the self within the exercise. Rather than wasting their attention on opinions about how things ought to have been. Opinions will not help during the flow of the exercise, though later when reflecting they can offer a guide to the performer on how she might want to develop or alter her use of herself on next encounter in the ball game. So, when I ask that performers work without opinion, I am asking that they engage with reality and separate the process of experiencing the exercise from the process of reflecting on that exercise. I am asking her actually to pay attention to herself. The notion of self is inherently complex. Our sense of selfhood is a combination of our thought processes and our relationship to physical reality. In the ball game we observe the detailed reality of how our sense of self manifests in the relationship between impulse and reaction. It is an encounter not with the image we try to project to others, not with our fantasies, not with our insecurities, but with the precise way we negotiate between the external universe and our internal universe. In paying attention to this activated self, we can find more efficient, easeful, and effective ways of using our limited resources to the service of others and of our own growth.